Greetings, flesh creatures. It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collector podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons! Terrorize! All right, hi, my name is Rick Alvarez. Welcome to Cut the Tape. And it's uh, Fourth of July weekend. Uh, happy Fourth of July, or as it's known here in America, Bastille Day. Uh, I was going through my garage, as is my Fourth of July tradition, and I found my Motu stuff. I found a lot of Motu stuff, stuff that I just have not been opening. And it's been years. And I thought, all right, let's open it. I, I got a selection of, you know, I was opening Point Tread here and I thought, all right, let's open some, some Motu stuff. So, I have an assortment of different, that's the dog, that's Diva. I have an assortment of different guys here. First, let's start with Roton. Now, I was looking at the prices of some of these guys online, but I, I got these all to open. So to me, you know, when I see something that's $70 a figure or $80 a figure, you know, like I got these because I love He-Man. I love Master of the Universe. So I wanted to open these. So there's Casey. So uh, this is Roton Evil Assault Vehicle, okay? So the Evil Assault Vehicle comes with a driver, Skelcon figure, which I think, if memory serves me, this was a 2000X henchman for Skeletor, which itself was, uh, based off an original you know, early 80s He-Man design. Pretty standard body, looks like it's the Skeletor body with uh, a new head, some new accessories. You know, they all share the same body for the most part. That's the magic of Moto. They can still make these characters amazing even though a lot of the tooling is shared, right? This guy's pretty cool. He actually comes with a working hilt. And he is the pilot. But I'm, you know, one thing, as the years go by, you want to take that sword and you want to keep it out of the, uh, the vinyl. Uh, just because, you know, they're gonna they're gonna melt together. It's Fourth of July, and the girls are doing uh, water balloons. So here is the brand new Roton. It's great. It's actually. I always wondered as a kid, like, where was the who was the the top part that I see? You know, in all the He-Man armor. This part, well, this part apparently only came with the model kit. So here it is. You know, Super 7, Mattel, they really put a lot of love into this line. So they included this, so you can have either the model kit version, or you can have the toy version, the toy accurate version. And this thing is, this is huge. This is, this is a huge, huge, you know, it's, it's got levers inside, all sorts of gearboxes. This is great. Absolutely love it. Tons of detail, tons of detail. And then here, there's going to be ambient noise today. Everyone's home. It's, it's, today is the 4th of July. So I went out and I got 
a tomahawk stick, because I always wanted to have a tomahawk stick. So I got myself a tomahawk stick. Nice. Nice. Does this come with a platform that I'm... It does. It does come with a platform. <clears throat> Which is great, because in the show, these actually hover, like blur. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Look at that. That's gonna be great when you display it in the, in the case. I recently got a new case for my Motu figures. Oh, this is great too. So here, you see, you have two different places where you can put the weapons. Yep. And that, I assume, is for you to decide who's gonna control the what, you know, what figure you put in here. And if it's a toy look versus a model kit look. Because if, it's a, if there's a pilot in here, they can't reach all the way up here. So you can take these weapons out, put them in here, Boom, boom, boom. Nice, nice, nice. Love it. Very sturdy stand. Absolutely fantastic. Couldn't be happier. Could not be happier. I do. Uh, I did open Point Dread earlier, which is, you know, I said, oh, I should, I should be cutting this tape on film. I just want to point out that the Talon Fighter Holy crap, it's a two-seater. It's a two-seater. Oh my goodness. And of course, I always use the base that attaches to Castle Grayskull, which I haven't even opened yet, but I will now, because now I have a display case. Um, so this is one of the figures I wanted to talk about. This is Standor. Interesting interesting choice for Mattel to make. They're like, screw you, Hasbro. You may have Mattel, you may have Marvel, but we got Stan Lee. Standor. Before time began, the great gods of the multiverse convened the Hall of Power to create all that was and all that will ever be. So they're saying he's the head architect, right? I mean, it's Stan Lee. It's got his glasses. I just, I mean, there really is no reason why this figure should exist. There, there, I just, I mean, you can say, all right, well, what about, what about, uh, you know, Sergeant Slaughter, Piper, right? Or the old Rocky figure, right? So, you know, why do those figures exist? Why are those figures okay? Well, this is a little different. This is more of a F you to them, I think. So that's why, this, that's what irks me about this. So I'm not gonna keep this one. I mean, I'm gonna keep this one sealed. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I didn't even buy it when it came out. And I like, I'm obsessed with Master Universe. I got it later when it was on clearance. That was the only, that, that was the right price for me. That like, to me, like I couldn't bring myself to buy that figure at the right price at, at regular retail. It just, it irked me. I was actually working at Hasbro when that figure came out. And uh, a couple of people were talking, they're like, yeah, like what's, cause you know, there's lots of people at Hasbro, a lot of the designers, they're, they're Motu fans, they're he fans. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's, you know, it's not something that you hide, you know, you put whatever inspires you in, you, in your space, right? Anyway, there was a lot of questions internally, like, 
why, what, what's the point, you know, what, what does this mean, what does this do, how, how does this, how does this help the He-Man IP, and here we are, how many years ago did this come out? Two thousand thirteen. So almost ten years ago. And I still wonder, like, how does that figure help the IP? How does that figure help Patel? How does it how does it help He Man? What does that mean for the figure going forward? And I want to say that maybe he showed up in one of the little mini comics, and that may have been it for him. Yeah, it was like a quick license deal, but I mean, it's not unprecedented. I had mentioned earlier that you know he had characters like Sark and Slaughter, and originally Big Boa was supposed to be Rocky Balboa. And that got shut down and retooled into the Big Boa character. But He-Man had never done that, right? I mean, He-Man always had like a little tongue and cheek action going on. You know, you had like Molar, which was inspired by a robot chicken. So they, you know, they could play the game. Um, one of the times, I think the second time I ever met Seth Green... He, it was at Hasbro. He actually came he got to the office. He was actually in my office for a little bit. We were talking art, and I showed him all the different pieces of art that were there. Son of a bitch. And um, he's like, yeah, I'm going upstairs to uh, pitch a trouser snake as a Comic-Con exclusive. Because the year before, Mattel had done Molar. And the higher-ups, I think, were all for it. But then they actually saw... Trouser snake, like they saw the clip, but they're like, nope, not gonna do that to G.I. Joe, which I think is incredibly awful missed opportunity. What is going on here? That's odd that they would be specific like that. Why is it so specific like that? So I think um, Griffin here was originally, I think, he, I think he is using parts of Battle Cat, but I think the idea was originally to make him into like one of the lion characters from Shira, or was that the subline? Like Glory Girls or something like that. Or golden golden goddesses. The pink the pink lion that had fur. I think that was Shira. That had flocked here on it. <clears throat> she was a battle cat remold. Or I, don't, I think it was just a redeco. Anyway, <clears throat> Griffin. And then you take your Tila. And you know, there we go. Yay! That's how I would ride it. I'd be I'd be like like yay! <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I would get on it backwards, and so I'd I'd be looking back behind me like, all right, this this thing knows where it's going. I don't I don't need to tell this thing where it's going. Anyway, is Griffin good or bad? Oh, evil flying beast. He's a bad guy. All right. I guess I could put like this man or something on it. Um, I do like. One of the things I like about the original He-Man line is they really did give enough attention to the bad guys. If you look at the original G.I. Joe and Transformers toy lines, it's disproportionate that, hey, the good, the good guys have, you know, 30 guys. The bad guys have, like, 12. All right. Um, but He-Man, it was almost split down the middle. In fact, I want to say the ratio is maybe like, if there's 10 good guys, there's eight bad guys. 
And the same can be said of vehicles. Now, a lot of the He-Man vehicles could have been used either way. Could have been used for good guys or bad guys. So, in that way, the vehicles were not really dexterous, but uh, not uh, not gender but no, That's not correct. Not heroically aligned. Not faction aligned. I think this was a PowerCon exclusive. Oh, was it? It does. PowerCon exclusive. Yay. All right. This was Trapjaw, Stratos, and Prince Adam, as I believe, as they appeared in the comic book and the little mini comics before the, the show came out, before the show was a thing. So let's talk about the show and how that came about. So before... Uh, you couldn't really have a show that was directly advertising to little kids. And then in the Reagan era, the administration sort of relaxed that law. So now you had toys directly based off television series for the sole purpose of the television show being an advertisement for the toy line. So what you had to do is, this is the reason why in the 80s you had those, we'll be right back, or He-Man will continue after these messages. Or in the case of He-Man, G.I. Joe, and even Transformers, you had PSAs. You had to have a lesson. You know, that was, that was one of the ways of, of getting around that. It's odd that they never have the same face when it comes to, to He-Man. Every, every designer, every expression of the brand has their own, man, this, this hand is tight. And that's why we're putting the sword in the back. Because that hand is tight. Yeah, I don't have a Prince Adam with a... This is a very feral-looking Prince Adam. Every expression of the brand changes the face, and then ultimately, pretty much every expression of the brand does a re-release with the original face. So, just curious how that seems to be a staple of the... Master of the Universe brand, much in the same way that now doing a black or a white version of Optimus um, and, and now Shattered Glass is becoming prominent. How that is becoming, you know, a staple of, of the character. Seeker molds, right? You get one seeker mold, you know the other ones are coming. And when we don't get the other ones, incredibly frustrating, right? One of the things I liked about the 2000X series, which was incredible, was that they made Stratos have a Sean Connery uh, voice. I've aligned myself with He-Man and I'm going to help him defeat the evil Skeletor. Ha 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 ha! Shuck it, Trebek! So, one of, those, one of those little funny things about, you know, He-Man. Gary Chuck, who did Optimus Primal in Beast Wars, Beast Machines, and Optimus Prime in the New Time Trilogy, he, uh, he played Man-at-Arms in He-Man. And Gary Chuck, a wonderful man, very nice, very, very nice human being. His voice is very distinct, but Gary Chalk 
did something, and I, I mean, I credit both the writers and the actor. In that 2000 X He-Man show, you forget that Gary Chalk is up in his primal. You really do hear, you hear the character of Man at Arms. So, uh, kudos to him and the entire team for making that happen. So at this point, they were kind of running out of, what do we do with Trapjaw? Or what do we do? We're running out of characters. We're making all these Princess Powers characters, which is fine. I mean, I got them all, you know, nothing wrong with that. I wish, I wish we had gotten all of them. And, uh, you know, the Bubble Palace or whatever, and a slime pet. But you know, this is this is like this is an appropriate convention exclusive. This is a great this is a great exclusive for a convention. You know, he doesn't have the regular trap jaw belt, so I'm like, I want to be able to hang these 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 things off him, uh, but I can't. But do I want to use that claw or do I want to use that? You know, I feel like I have plenty of other things that I never get to use this one. And like, since he's the off color trap jaw, I'm gonna use that one. Yay. Well, my legs are asleep. Uh, so that is cut the tape. Thank you. Uh, remember to register to vote, wash your hands, get vaccinated, be kind to others where appropriate. And, um, Doesn't matter how long ago you got a figure or what the value of it is now as opposed to when you got it. If it's something you wanna open, if it's something you wanna play with, it's your figure, no one has a right to tell you not to open it. That being said, enjoy and cut the tape.